Today, Ellen will speak to us about how technology can be harnessed to affect societal change and give us examples of what Tech for Good has undertaken over the last number of years. Ellen, we look forward to your presentation. Thank you, Joyce. That was a lovely introduction. Um, as you said, I'm, my name is Ellen and I have a job in IT at Concern. Um, and a couple of years ago, um, we started out on this new venture to look at Tech for Good in Dublin. So I want to set a little bit of context uh, for you just about the global movement. So before we started our group, we had a look around um, and really over the last decade, there has been a sort of a slow movement across uh, main cities around the world to start um, for volunteers and, and, and small groups to start thinking about harnessing the power of technology to solve social problems and to help communities and individuals. So there are groups in all sorts of places. I'll read out a few to give you an idea. Obviously London and Barcelona and Geneva, but also Brighton and Edinburgh and Cardiff and Exeter and Vancouver and Mumbai, Nairobi, Auckland, San Francisco, Adelaide, um, and lots of places I probably don't know about. Um, so those groups um, tend to have a similar theme. Um, and these are our four principles for Dublin, which Joyce has mentioned. But I think we all sort of have a similar ethos, which is that we, we want to sort of be a kind of an antidote to the, ne to the negative side of big tech, to you know, the pure monetization of us and our data, um, and to look at the tools that are available now and that are far more accessible than they ever have been, and how we can harness those, uh, those tools and solve problems ourselves. So, you know, it, these groups tend to start small and grow based on the context of their own city. So a lot of these cities have big tech hubs, but they also have entrepreneurs and startups and students and retired people and enthusiasts and um, lots, of, lots of people who want to get involved. So um, we started our group um, to try and find out what we could do in Dublin. Um, so I'll just talk a bit more about, about our group. So we started in 2017. I was introduced to my co-founder on Twitter by a guy in America who said, you two are talking about similar things and you're both in Dublin. And it was as simple as that, really. So we met and decided that we would um, start a group in Dublin and see um, what might happen. And in the two and a half years since, we have not run out of people, ideas, <coughs> speakers, volunteers, um, kind supporters, so we're still, we're still going. And the idea was, if there was no appetite, we'd, we'd, we'd just stop, so we've continued. So what we tried to do, and what we've, we tried to find a space where we could have some impact, and what we found is there were a lot of people working on small projects uh, which have the potential to really help a lot of people. And we wanted to amplify their voices, to get people into rooms, to talk about the projects, to maybe offer help and support, to bring t technical people together with non-technical people. And it was really important to us that it wasn't just a techie group. There are lots of those in Dublin. They're really important, you know, artificial intelligence groups and all these groups. But we wanted everyday people to come in and, and to learn more about tech and get involved. So since starting, we've had 22 or 23 events, I think. We, um, they're all free, so we've given away <coughs> about 1,000 free tickets and featured 40-plus projects um, where people come and talk about the area that really interests them and the work they're doing. Um, we use Meetup Group, and on there we have um, about 1,900 members. Um, the Meetup is great because you know people can hear about the events. We also put them on Eventbrite, but it's really quite a simple model. We go out and uh, find people, and they come and talk. Um, we have a kind sponsor, Liberty IT, where Andy works pay for donuts and tea and coffee. Um, AIB give us a room above the bank in Grafton Street, which is very central. People can get there easily. Um, we outgrew a smaller room and we got a bit bigger, so we had to move up a step. Um, I'm going to go back to that slide because I want to talk about the events and really give you an idea about um, the topics that we featured. So you can see a few examples up there, um, but Tech for Good is such a wide umbrella. The basic principle is if someone's trying to solve a problem or help people using technology, really taking profit out of the equation in the short term, it's something we can talk about. So um, if you go onto our website, you'll see all the, all the historical events, but in the last few months we've had, for example, we had a, an event in June about using 3D printing as a kind of um, a disruptive technology and what people have been doing with 3D printing. We had a speaker who talked about how he had been building artificial hands for children who were waiting for prosthetics. 
Um, and often you have to wait a while because children grow really quickly, but he was able to 3D print hands and, and multiple versions in different sizes. So that, um, and the kids also were involved in seeing the 3D printing and um, he would leave, he bought cheap printers from China and would leave them in situ after he left. So um, uh, that's a really interesting um, event that we had. Um, we had another one on neurodiversity, which is where we met my dyslexic. Mark's going to talk more about their product today. Um, and we also had someone to talk at the same event about um, how you can make your workplace more autism friendly and some of the things that we might not always see, which can be minor adjustments which can make workplaces more accessible. Um, in October then, we launched a, a new free Irish sign language app um, which had um, been developed to teach people sign language using short videos um, and everyone came along and used the app and it was really great because Irish sign language is slightly different to other sign languages so we didn't have one of those before. Um, you can find out more about that online. And then last month we had quite a niche event all about bees and how people are using artificial intelligence and big data to, and the Internet of Things to figure out um, bee behaviours and to try and inform the best policies for protecting and, and, and developing bee col colonies. So you can see from those examples that it's so wide ranging, like you really can find little pockets of activity across so many different topics. And that's why it's so, so fun and interesting. So I just want to go back now to the inclusion and diversity question. You know, it's a really, it was really important to us from the very beginning that this group was for everyone. Um, we, as with two female founders, were um, determined to have 50% of our speakers be women. We've actually um, ended up having all sorts of different speakers, including children, um, people signing with Irish Sign Language, um, we've had uh, people with autism speak, we've had professors, we've had volunteers, um, obviously people from non-profits as well. So a really wide range of speakers, and, and really anyone who wants to speak can. Mm -hmm. um, we also have a sort of Q&A at every session, lots of interaction. We want um, people to know they don't have to be technical to come along, so we make that clear. And we put a sort of everybody welcome message um, on all the events, and I invite people to bring a guest. We have kept all our events free. We don't want cost to be a barrier. Um, and then we've also made sure that you know, our venues are accessible. We had to stop using one place because they didn't really have wheelchair access, mm. and we felt like we didn't want to really have to worry about Absolutely. someone not being able to get into mm. the building. So we try and find topics that are inspiring. We try to um, listen to the, the group and feedback, um, take their feedback and, and change things around. So, um, so as much input as possible. It's not, we want it to be less about, less led and more, you know, collaborative. Right, so just a little bit really about um, Dublin. I, I don't know if everyone knows about all of these groups. These are just some that I know about. So. Since we started in the two, two and a half years, we have found a range of groups, most of them, the majority volunteer-led, um, sort of unofficial evenings and weekends types of groups who run um, their own version of this sort of problem solver, change maker um, enterprises. So everything from Code for Ireland, who are building solutions to everyday problems, to Data Kind Dublin, who offer to do data analysis and data science for Nonprofits who maybe can't afford to do that themselves. Um, we've got, you know, people encouraging new startups, Block W that, that you know, I met Joyce through. Um, people hacking access ac accessibility issues around Dublin, um, and then you know, people matching volunteers with nonprofits who would, you know, love to have some some help, but very specialised help. So I think what's fantastic about Dublin that there is this vibrant, you know, ecosystem of change makers and people who want to um, to influence and change their environment, and we all support each other. So we meet up, we talk on Twitter, we invite people to each other's events. You know, we're all trying to do a lot with not much money, so we have to help each other. So if someone says to me, "I've got this event," will you tell your members? We try and we try and do that where there's, you know, a common theme. Um, so I'm not sure what time I'm at, but I'm not going to... You're doing great. I'm doing great, okay. Yeah. So, so this is my last slide, and I know I've rushed through a bit, but um, there is that we did do a TED Talk in June, um, and, and actually I haven't mentioned any of the examples in that talk, so if you watch that, you'll, you'll get three different examples of, of our Tech for Good um, experience. 
But there's lots more we want to do. Obviously, we have limited time and resources, but we would love to share more projects um, and share stories. So if people know of things happening, you know, the only way we hear really is someone dropping us an email or, or tweeting us. Um, we want to make more connections, um, both locally but also globally. You know, we do talk to the other Tech for Good group leaders um, and share ideas, but there's probably a lot more we could do there as well. I mean, we'd love to have, you know, UK Island Summit or, a, you know, something mm. along those lines. Obviously, that's a, a bigger enterprise. We want to advocate more for this trustworthy, ethical approach to tech, which is so easy to forget about and it's so important. Um, you know, if our human rights are not respected by the tech that's being mm. built, then really we're, we're in a world of trouble and um, we have to sort of raise that issue at every opportunity. We want to offer more help. So when, when volunteers, are not, when people come to our to our meetups and say they want to volunteer, you know, we'd love to be able to find ways to match them effectively with organisations that need help. And to support side projects and collaborations, like um, Andy's going to talk about a side project which came out from one of our events about a year ago. Um, and we'd love to be able to <coughs> see more of that happening. Um, sometimes I get random emails of people wanting to fund projects and help and support. And we don't really have a mechanism for that at the moment. But these, some of these projects are not necessarily established enough to avail of like Social Innovation Fund Ireland or Social Enterprise Ireland. They may be a bit um, sort of stuck in a gap where you know, some support might be useful. And then, so there may be a gap there. We've had contact from other parts of Ireland where people were thinking about starting groups in Galway and Derry. Particularly, we'd like to encourage them to do that. The groups are all independent, but we think the more, the merrier. Um, and to raise this conversation about, you know, the, um, the importance of technology um, being used for good um, to as high a level as we can get, tell as many people as we can, um, and really get to a point where, you know, the default should be that technology is something that serves us, mm -hmm. serves our needs, serves our communities, um, respects our human rights, and doesn't cause us long-term <coughs> injury or damage or loss of, uh, loss of power in our, in our own decision-making. So we would like to see all tech really to be tech for good, which is why we continue with this quite simple message um, and, and talking to as many people as we can, really. So that's my introduction. Thank you for listening. Thanks, Ellen, for that very powerful message. And I think everybody here can take that on board themselves and let other people know about it. But that is a really important because we hear all the time about technology, what it's going to do for jobs, what money is going to make and all the rest of it. But in real impact will be in these little things that change people's lives. So thank you very much for that. Um, we move now on to Andy. And Andy is, is the um, resident technologist I learned at lunchtime for Tech for Good. Yeah, he's, he's a big supporter of the group. He's he a great supporter of the group. He's a software engineer. Uh, a technologist with Liberty IT, and he's worked in a whole range of areas, including banking, uh, DIT, um, he's a computer science background and, and uh, business and information system, and is one of Silicon uh, Republic's FinTech influencers to follow. So we've met him here today, it's very <laughs> important. So Andy um, will discuss the development of technology-based solutions to support homelessness services and kind of very well links into what Ellen has been saying about just seeing a problem and see how tech can support that. So we look forward to your presentation. And I think any of you would like to go to Tech for Good Meetup, there's one tomorrow night as it happens in AIB, um, on the your homelessness app yes. as well, is that right? And so yep. that's another opportunity to see what happens in tech for good. So Andy, thank you very much. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Sana I'd like to gesticulate as a as I talk. The um, so Andy Sullivan, um, working in the GIT, which is based part of the neutral kind of global multinational in insurance company. We, we don't actually sell in the market here, like, you know, like our, our sister company, my wife's insurance insurances, we only build stuff for our parent company. So kind of the, the, the main reason we'd be involved in CSO is actually something we're interested in, 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 in doing is we want to, we want to, want to use our, 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 technical, our technical skills for, for social good and, and to thankfully it's, it's something that the leadership, you know, support. And there's kind of two things that you wanted to, 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 to touch on today. So I'm going to give, give an example of kind of, of you know, of this, this, this work for homeless charity we're doing, but also kind of what I wanted to, to, to 
touch on briefly about, I suppose, the ethics of engineering, you know? To kind of be, uh, it, it, I think engineers like me are, are quite privileged enough, you know, for one thing, it's, 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 not, the, it's not the job market, but also the job today, I have a job to, 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 to tomorrow more or less, uh, probably in any country. So kind of engineers have, have the, the, the privilege of being able to choose what they work on. You know, and kind of, and it'd be, it'd be, it'd be a lot of news recently as I was to, to, to tell the guys over lunch, kind of, companies like, like Google and, 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 and Amazon, AWS and Microsoft, who some of their workers and engineers are beginning to feel the dubious about some of the contracts they might be doing with places like the Pentagon, they're going to like, like mass, mass surveillance of their own populations and that. But like, en engineers have, have the ability to actually say, you know, hang, hang on a second, is this ethical? Should, 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 should we do this? You know, kind of to try to influence their own company or even them to just leave and uh, take their skills to assist with some else. And it's probably something which more uh, so junior engineers need to be kind of be, 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 so be, be made, 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 made uh, uh, aware of that they do have a voice and, and they can influence to, to, to things well because businesses will generally, just, or, or business are mainly interested in the money. But, uh, uh, of course, it, it is probably an old one which kind of is something for. Uh, I've probably seen many times at this stage, but like I, 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 I give a lot of talks in schools, in colleges, kind of senior business leaders, and pretty much every single talk I give about anything, I, I, I choke this in because I just like to see what what your action is. So it's kind of, this is basically a uh, a, a, a kind of the, uh, a, a modern look at the, at the classic trolley problem. So kind of if 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 it's just a driverless car, okay, there's no steering wheel, there's, a, there's, a, there's a, no brakes. It isn't like people call them driverless cars. They're not really cars, kind of, the cars are steering wheels, you know? So kind of like, you know, a hundred years ago, people you, you used to call cars horses carriages, you know, kind of in 20 years, we won't call them cars, we'll call them pods or something. But, you know, if, 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 if there's a, a, a driver's car, it's, 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 it's working on the road, there's some passengers in it, for some reason there's a blockage, you know? It, 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 here's, here's the bollard, potentially it's a tree which has fallen. A tree has fallen in, 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 in a storm, and um, potentially th those people aren't supposed to be there. Maybe, maybe they are, maybe they aren't. I know it's a crosswalk there. But, but the car has sensors, has LIDAR, has radar. It knows that if it, um, it's, it's going to kill these people if, if it hits them, but it also knows if it swerves in, into the next lane to miss them, it's, it's going to kill everybody <coughs> in, in the car. Okay? So what should the driver's car do? Open to the crowd. It, it, an amount of time. It just, just seems so like kind of, if, <coughs> if the people are there, it's, it's, it's 80 kilometers an hour, but drive cars to drive faster. So notice a tree falls, nothing to do. But, it, but the, the sensors will, the sensors will, will compute this many seconds. It doesn't have time to stop. <laughs> and it's a good question, actually. It's a really good question. I've asked some school kids about this because they get really indignant about this, you know? But so they get away from one of eyes? Are gestures, hand signals? They could, but it's, like, it's going really fast. Like. <laughs> if it runs up, it's weird. Yeah. 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 So they don't have time to get out of the way. Wave the flag. Yeah. 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 Okay. So like, it's, it's, someone's going to die. Okay, okay, so like, if, if, if I'm playing devil's advocate, okay, what happens if, it, if, if it's a prison van? Does that make any difference? You know, yeah. what, 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 what happens if the prison van going to the death row and the people in the van are going to be executed? <laughs> you know? But, but, but so, like, it's, it, it, these are really hard questions to, to, to answer, right? But, but so, the, the, the main point I'm making all this, right, is that someone like me, right, probably a white male in his 20s <coughs> or, or, or 30s, is making his decisions somewhere already. So, so, so yeah. someone, there's someone in, 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 in Silicon Valley, it's, 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 it's probably a guy, and they're, and they're at a computer. If then else, you know, if, if cars are this speed and children on road, like, and, and that's quite interesting. <coughs> I kind of, like, I, like I, I said, I give a lot, a lot of talks to, 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 to the kids in schools about kind of, and I, I'm always telling like engineering is a great career choice for a lot of reasons, but it, it, you have the potential, the chance to influence these sort of things, mm. you know, so kind of like, the, like, the, like the, the, the children of today will make the decisions later on. So I just thought it, it, it's interesting, apparently, how. How annoyed people get about it. But the, 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 the other answer, there is an answer, right? In 20 years' time, if, if only cars are drivers, we won't walk on roads anymore. Uh, none of us walk on motorways, because it's, 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 it's yeah. Eventually, none of us will walk on roads. Um, cool. So, like, a, a, an example of this kind of, so, like, a, a kind of, a, a, I see kind of a tech for good kind of having two, two strands. One has been ethical 
in the work you actually do, and kind of and, and, and the tools that you use in the skills kind of outside of your of your of your, your, your core job potentially, or 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 can actually if your core job can it, can be can actually be, be something good is is using you know, is using those skills as well. So I know a lot of tech companies and in, in, in particular quite quite interested in CSO. A lot of CSO to do have. As much new technology, it's kind of they did to go places. They kind of they you know like they, they paint walls, kind of they plant things, which is amazing, amazing as well. But we also have the ability to build things and and, and, and create things. So kind of at at at, at a tech robot event last year, I, I heard uh, Antje Flynn as the CEO of, of the uh, inner city of Nomus. They did basically it's an interesting charity. It's it's almost entirely volunteers. So kind of the CEO CEO's volunteer, the marketing guys is a volunteer, and and, and each night on the, on the, on the Streets of Dublin, they send out three or four group, uh, large groups of people on the streets with the basement food and clothes, and kind of and, and comfort to, 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 to people who are s s s sleeping rough. So, kind of, all of us are home, kind of watching Netflix or, or bed, GT bread in the streets, bringing help to, to people who need it. And I, I, as part of this process, I'm dealt with them a few, few times. And it's kind of like if, if, if people, some things, some things homeless people, you know, are, are just kind of people on drugs and things, but kind of the, the, the people you meet outside of mental problems are kind of they're not, they're not on the streets because of, of any choice really, and it's, um, <coughs> it's it, so kind of the the the, the, the actually CEO was saying to me last year, he was, I think it's cost about fifteen grand to build to, to, to build to build an app to, to help these volunteers and they just couldn't afford it, and even to have fifteen grand, they wouldn't spend it on that, and so like I I, I basically said, listen, like my company should be able to do 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 something with that, so so kind of. In the main, main, main problems of summer, the summer this year and others, we'd be basically building them an app for the volunteers to use, and we'd be building kind of website as well on the, on the back end. Um, really simple app, right? And kind of, it's like, uh, I think it's kind of, I mentioned here, kind of, like, uh, uh, I'll jump back to kind of what, what she is. It's when, when you're doing work like this, try to understand what, 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 your, what your need is, because a, a lot of people actually try and create solutions for charities that they think they need. But they don't actually need, you know. So kind of, so like, like when the, the original need, the, 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 the original need for, for from the, the charity was to to give them a gift of about twenty or so uh, tablets, like um, like like uh, uh, iPads or other tablets from I think from 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 eBay or LinkedIn or someone. I said, listen, it'd be great for volunteers could use these when they go out because because currently their entire process is paper. Go out every night, they did the kind of people to meet, the kind of things which 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 you need, and it's all on, on paper. When I digitise it, as as soon as I met the uh, uh, users, so kind of the volunteers go out tonight, they said we, we don't use tablets because it's really too awkward, we want them on our phones. And kind of, and so we have kind of some proper design thinking, kind of workshops with them, kind of what real problems are, kind of we'll find out what, what, what great things they, 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 they run on it. And we, we kind of come up with a big shopping list of all, all the useful things. Once I, I went with David at night and a few times and saw what they do, I realised they, they, they didn't need any of that stuff. You know, kind of, it's, it's just what, 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 what the child needed. And, so, and, and since then, kind of, we, we built something pretty simple, but to, to, to solve it, it basically just allows them to, it has kind of in, all the kind of information you may need when you're out and about, when the, 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 the different places call to kind of find out if somebody's a hostel, et cetera, or help. Um, and it, it also gives them the tool to count the people they meet. Kind of, uh, and honestly, kind of five emails here, four, 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 four emails here, kind of, uh, uh, and then in the background, it's kind of a, a, we begin a, a website which gives them all this information, a tablet format on maps, and then basically we, we, we've digitized what, what, what is the paper process for them. And so then so they can start to use the proper data analytics and kind of on, 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 on where the resources are needed, etc. Um, and the interesting, uh, uh, I suppose, IT point for all this, it's all, it's all being deployed and built on serverless architecture. And if, if, if it's basically it's just on Amazon's cloud. And it, it's basically running for free. So kind of, I think the total cost, apart from engineering work, and um, the total cost of this is twelve dollars for kind of actually the, the main name for the website. Yeah. But because the usage is low enough, when you're running things on serverless, you, you, you get so much for free. Yeah. So it's, it's basically a free solution for uh, for yeah. a, a charity. Yeah. Whereas kind of if, if they went to an actual company to to, to, to build it for them, they'd probably charge them you to maintain the fees and stuff. You know. So um, it's uh, that's their website. If you're in, Interested in, in, in talking to or in finding out more about the Chichi chart itself? I said to tomorrow night in Grafton Street, then we, 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 we kind of did the, the, another kind of tech world meet up about, uh, about homelessness. The CEO from ICH will be there as well. So there's going to be someone from, from giveback.ie, which, which, which basically can come up with a, a browser plugin for your, your internet browser on your, on your computer. Which, and, and, and they've kind of they, they, they tied into a place like Amazon. Basically, if you spend money online, uh, the, the ICA charity 
will get a percentage of it. <coughs> and, and there's a lady called Zoe uh, Obenheim, who's, who, who's basically been started at homeshopper.ie, which is, um, it's basically, she's, she's come to a way to, to digitise uh, the transfer of council houses between people who have council houses. They could, could currently call them by index cards. And she, 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 she basically comes up with a, a way to, 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 to digitise it. The, 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 that's all tomorrow night at 6 o'clock on Apple Street. Mm. Thank you very much, Andy. I think what you've shown very clearly, I think maybe Owen Murphy should have a little word with you if, if, in terms of looking at these issues because they're very important to be able to document what happens and you've shown how with particular interest you can use technology in a way that helps the user themselves but also the charity to expend their resources much more effectively. And I think it's very interesting just in the broad area of technology in Europe, and particularly AI, um, the ethical question is a really key issue. And I think that's what we think generally in technology we can add something to. So this is a really another important part of that ethical approach. So thank you very much. Um, Mark, Mark is the COO of iDyslexic. It's the world's first social network for people living and working with dyslexia and and or ADHD. It's in 40 countries. I know um, uh, Mark will go through this with you. Just to tell you a little bit about Mark, you won't be surprised to know that he's an entrepreneur. His background is in marketing. He has also worked as a project manager, sales, and as a machine operator. Yep. So he's a broad range of experiences. And he'll speak to us now yep. about how a social application for people living and working with dyslexia and ADHD works. And I think importantly, Mark, you tell your own personal journey of how you, how you get, got involved. So thank you very, very much, Mark. Okay, a slightly different presentation. I'm just going to talk a little bit about myself. And <laughs> <laughs> that's <laughs> that's <laughs> always <Yeah>. nice. <laughs> yeah. but, uh, I suppose my journey, not more so about myself, but um, George Washington once said that the hardest conflict is the greatest triumph. Now, 250 years ago, it was suspected that George Washington had learning difficulties. And things have not changed in 250 years. It's absolutely incredible that we still have 80% of students who were bullied in school. We also have 43% of those kids ending up with mental health issues. One in six women diagnosed with a learning difficulty end up attempting suicide. 80% of suicide notes have dyslexic type spelling mistakes. So that was a, a report by the Samaritans in 2018 from the UK and Ireland where 6,400 people had committed suicide. 80% said dyslexic type notes. It's terrible, absolutely terrible. So I'm quite asking every single person here today, if you could help someone today with a learning difficulty, would you? It could be a family member, it could be a friend, it could be a colleague. One in five people on this planet has a learning difficulty. That's 20% of the whole world population. It's absolutely astounding. It's also free to help people through iDyslexic. It's a free app. You go through it in the end. <coughs> Dyslexia and ADHD are massive issues for people with these hidden difficulties. I'm one of those. So is my son. I have dyslexia, ADHD. I've struggled in my life and that's why I want to do something about my little man, Mackenzie. Mackenzie is now 10. When he was six, I was sitting on the side of his bed, reading him a bedtime story about Peter Rabbit. Now you're probably all familiar with Peter Rabbit. He's mischievous, gets up to all sorts of things. But he's a likeable character. He was surrounded by Mr. McGregor, who was the farmer, and Mr. McGregor's cat. And at the end of the garden was the fox, and the fox was jumping up and down, and he was sneering, and he was laughing. Poor Peter Rabbit was there, he was isolated, he was all alone, and he was afraid, and he didn't know what to do. But he did, he got away, as he always does in the story. But Mackenzie got up out of bed, crying, and he said to me, Dad, I know exactly how Peter Rabbit feels. I have that every single day in school, I'm bullied. I have no friends, I'm all alone, the teacher gives out to me, everybody gives out to me, I don't understand what's going on. And nobody understands me, and I don't understand anything. I look the same as everyone else, but I'm totally different. I feel different. He then said to me, Dad, 
I hate my life and I wish I was dead. Now Mackenzie was six, six years of age. He was just turning seven and I was devastated like anybody here who was a parent or has a family member who has difficulties. I was absolutely devastated. I didn't know what to do. So I started to look around, looked at different places and I didn't know where to start. So it was the start of a journey and I soon realised that I wasn't on my own. As I said, one in five people out there have a learning difficulty. That's 20% again of the population. Just keep that in your head. Over a billion people. And from research, it rises to two billion when you add in family members and people who are working in the space. So it's a massive, massive chunk. It's actually the largest minority in the world. Issues that I came across in my own journey. We went about getting a diagnosis or an assessment and it took nearly three years. And they talked about early intervention, but they actually don't step in and help kids in school <coughs> until they're eight. So we spent nearly three years waiting for this diagnosis. When we did get it, nothing changes there. And we, except we started to work on an individual educational plan in the school. Now we were lucky, we got a plan, we got a, a meeting every six months for about 30 minutes to an hour. Now it's insufficient for a child who has not got a difficulty, let alone someone who has. The whole area was disconnected. Everybody was doing their own thing, everyone was funded differently, and information was drip fed. And we struggled, I struggled to find out what was actually happening in the space. But then you add in stigma, ridicule, bullying. It's massive. We had to do something about it. Now I was lucky. There was two other guys on a similar journey, <coughs> Brendan and Anthony Morrissey, co-founders of iDyslexic. So what is iDyslexic? And that's probably where iDyslexic is a social, educational application. It's the world's first social network built here in Ireland <coughs> for people living and working with dyslexia and ADHD. It's a safe place for people to share their experiences, tell their story, because you don't have that on social media if you have a spelling mistake. People are picking on you. There's trolls out there that will actually pick up on little things. You can't be free. You can be free on our side. We also have a geo-mapping feature to connect people from all over the world. Mackenzie actually found friend who he now goes horse riding with on a Saturday morning and it's fantastic. They're similar. They're very similar so it's two tiggers into one space but it's, it's interesting. Um, but we've also built in, we're not just a social network, we've built in a secure online classroom for people, parents, teachers, caseworkers, mentors, coaches to come together and work on that individual plan 24-7. So you no longer have to wait for six months for a meeting and when you get to that meeting you don't know what way you're going because you try to pivot and it's no good. It's like Groundhog Day, it's starting all over again. But the fact that you can now get in and work on a child's plan 24 mm seven. -hmm. The caseworkers and the professionals are telling us that the difference it's making for them is they are no longer logistics, logistical managers because they have to arrange meetings with all the people involved. They can just see more people. This is a little video. Hi there, welcome to iDyslexic. A new super cool social community for those living and working with dyslexia and ADHD. Meet new friends just like you. Share your story. While here, check out an iDyslexic secure classroom. With iDyslexic, the future is bright. Specially designed to connect parents, students, teachers and caseworkers to help with student IEP progress communication. Be part of something great. Sign up for your free account today. Available on iOS and Android. So thank you. The impact we're having can be seen across the world. We're now in just over 80 countries. As I said to you downstairs, we got a message last week from Antarctica. No. Yeah. It's amazing. It is amazing. We're reaching in places that we could never think of. And we're only up and running since this time last year. We only launched in December 2018. Impact, as I said, is massive because we're working on artificial intelligence to help students learn the way they learn and help teachers teach the way students learn. Mm. It's very important work we're doing, and I'm absolutely thrilled to be involved with it. The social purpose really is, is we're connecting everyone in this space, we're bringing them together. So, like a parent, when they start that journey, they know where to go. They just go on to dyslexic, and then the whole gamut of everything to do with dyslexia and ADHD is there. But we're also levelling the playing field for people who are in the neurodiversity space. By using AI, we are creating the environment to level that space. So people can learn at their own pace in a safe place. 
very important. We're enabling people to learn the way teachers teach and the way people learn. Again, as I said, it's a safe place for people with learning difficulties to flourish. But it's access 24 seven and the benefits, as I said, can be seen not just by parents and caseworkers, but students, schools, and everyone involved. You'll be familiar with a lot of these faces up here. And this is the brilliant thing, is everyone talks about superpowers. Superpowers for people with ADHD and dyslexia are not technically superpowers. It's the environment and the circumstances that you create enable people to flourish. And that's exactly what we're doing at Ivy Dyslexia. We're enabling people to flourish in a safe space. Even though this little guy won't. That's Mackenzie. So it's social tech, and it's, I'm absolutely delighted that Jess has to come and talk today, but the social tech for good is really, really important, and we're at the forefront of this, and it's brilliant people like yourselves that can change the way tech is delivered out there. We, right now we have a great opportunity to build technology to support and help people. I put this in top technology trends because I'm trying to influence people's thoughts. <laughs> so it's the way we're going. It is a trend and we want to be there. So what I'm asking you to do today is, everyone sitting here, you don't have to do it right now, but 20% of your social network on your phones, 20% of people on your social network possibly could have a learning difficulty. So all I'm asking you to do is, later on today is to download a free app and tell your network all about I Dyslexic. Because it could be a family member, it could be a friend, it could be a colleague, it could be people on that network who are hiding because of fear of losing a job because that's what happens. When people find out you have a learning difficulty, you're looked upon as different. They're not. We are fantastic, and we have a brilliant message to give, is to change and make a difference, and make a real difference. When you come on to high dyslexia, you're verified. So that's why we're safe. So you, you have to show your credentials. We'll verify through face recognition and everything else. <coughs> so what we're trying to do is connect a disconnected world. Thank you.